it'd, it'd be helpful to know what you guys are wearing to visualize you better. Uh, I'd like you to guess. I'm guessing that it is a t-shirt. Oh, that's right. It's probably blue. Wrong. Gray. Mm, closer. Black. Hey. Black t-shirt. Are you wearing jeans? Black jeans. Black on black. Black on black. Okay, so that that's Sean. I get a pretty good visual of Sean. Yep. Jeremy, I'm going to guess that you are fully nude. I'm in black jeans. So oh, I was just going <laughs> to... I was just going to picture you nude. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to I'd Buy That for a Dollar, a podcast about inexpensive, common, and underappreciated records that are waiting to be rediscovered. Before I introduce any of the hosts of this program, I'd like to start today's episode with a quick disclaimer. Now that we are getting more fans and followers, we're also getting more critics of the podcast, and people are becoming very picky about whether we are actually following the rules of how valuable or not valuable the records are that we selected. I would like to state, as probably the uh, foremost Discogs value authority, that the record we're talking about today is probably worth about $10, not 5 But the artist that we are talking about is pretty obscure. Most people don't collect them, and it's easier than normal to find this artist for very cheap. But if you were to buy a good copy on Discogs right now, you'd have to spend about 10 bucks. So we think it still fits our criteria. Don't talk to us. My name is Sean Hartman, <laughs> and I'm joined today by... I disagree with everything Sean said. I disagree with all of that. Well... I'm with you, dear Facts listener. are facts. <laughs> I'm with the people. So my name is Sean Hartman. I'm the host of this podcast. And I'm joined today by David Letterman's stunt double, Jeremy Ruggles. Nothing to say? I or... thought it'd be funnier if I don't say anything. <laughs> oh. Was it funny? Huh. Uh, it was just confusing. I just assumed there was a technical error. Maybe that would have worked if we were actually looking at each other as opposed to pandemic broadcasting from our separate locations. Oh, I'm looking at you. <laughs> from where? <laughs> from Studio A in New York City. <laughs> hey, there this we go. This is The Tonight Show. That's the wrong... <laughs> That's Jay Leno. I don't care. I'm <laughs> with the people. <laughs> And of course, we're also joined by post Ulysses anger aggregator Peter Cook. Finnegan's Wake anger <laughs> aggregator. <laughs> I can't remember what you said, but it was uh, James Joyce. Yeah, sure. We'll we'll just roll with it. So, Peter, I'm sorry to uh, spring that disclaimer on you without saying anything about it. Would you like to uh, defend or agree with the statement? Well, funny you should ask, Sean. I was going to address that as well, but you did it all for me. Oh, so you you and I are both not with the people. We are against Jeremy, as usual, on this episode. Nothing's changed for us amidst this pandemic, and I'd buy that for a dollar, other than we can't <laughs> see each other. We just picture each other in our head. True. What album is it, though? Yeah, tell us about the album that you have selected, Peter. The album that I am bringing today to talk about is Matthew's Southern Comfort, the first solo album by Ian Matthews, although it was released under the name Matthews Southern Comfort, although that was not the band at the time. It became the band after this release. It's kind of yeah, confusing. After dropping the apostrophe from the, from the title. Yeah, he, well, do we, I guess, do we want to just play a song before we, we start talking about all that info? We like to get to things. Yeah, let's some do that. sounds quickly. I am going to start with the song Sweet Bread from Side 2, Track 3, I believe. Please and thank you, Jeremy. Nice. That's one of my favorites. Sweet 
I'm glad you picked that song as the opening track, Peter, because I was familiar with some of Ian Matthews' work before this, but not as much of this album. So I was doing a little bit of reading before I played it at first, and it said that, you know, this was him moving from the folk sound into a more American country and rock and roll inspired sound. And the first few tracks in the album have very little actual rock and roll influence. And I was thinking, mm-hmm. like, where is that in the album? And then songs like Sweetbread come on later on. I was like, oh, there's the actual straight up rock and roll influence. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's that kind of country rock leanings as well. Mm -hmm, Definitely. Ian Matthews was part of the band Fairport Convention prior to this, the uh, uh, English folk rock outfit. And he had left in 1969. But yet the members from Fairport Convention, I should say he I, I say he left. He was basically kicked out of the band. But the members of Fairport Convention, yeah, he was uh, basically not welcome to a recording session. And that was how he found out he was no longer in the band. Harsh. Yeah. (laughs) Members of Fairport Convention are all over this album, though. Ashley Hutchings, Simon Nickel, and Richard Thompson are all featured on this record. And it was produced. Richard Thompson is the man. Definitely. I don't Just know how to fami- say that. I don't know how familiar our listeners are with Richard Thompson, but he's got a lot of excellent work he's done over the years. You probably won't find Richard and Linda Thompson in the but well, some of his records end up in the bargain bins. But I think a lot of them are a little pricier these days. He's great though. Fantastic guitarist, songwriter. He's got some albums with his ex-wife, Linda, that are just above and beyond. Any of the ones with the words lights in the titles of his albums are good. Shoot out the <laughs> lights. I want, I want to see the bright lights tonight. This album, though, actually, he produced some of this album, but he's not credited. Richard Thompson produced some of this album. He's not credited, though, because he didn't get along with Ian Matthews' management. So he walked away and didn't really want his name associated with the project other than that he did write a song for the record and, you know, appears on it credited as a player. The production is credited to someone named Steve Barlby. And that isn't a real person. Steve Barlby is, uh, it's a pseudonym of two producers, two, two songwriters and producers named Ken Howard and Alan Blakely. They were an English songwriting team who wrote for bands like Dave D dozy beaky, Mick and Titch, is that name familiar to either of you? Nope. Uh, yeah, yeah, they had like a couple minor early rock and roll hits, right? Yeah, Hold Tight is probably the best known. It was used in Quentin Tarantino's Death Proof in a very notorious scene. Yeah, I was just going to say, that's that's where I first heard about them and then kind of saw their records around here and there after that. Yeah, they, they mentioned them by name in the scene. 
they also did stuff, wrote songs for The Herd, which was Peter Frampton's band when he was like 16, 17 years old. So they're credited as co-producers along with Matthews. And as I mentioned, Thompson, dad just didn't want his name on it. This is Matthews transitioning away from that folk music, more traditional English folk that Fairport Convention were going more and more in that direction. They kind of started out more like Jefferson Airplane. They definitely were, they were produced by Joe Boyd, if either of you know that name. No. He, nope. he was one of those guru types who oversaw a lot of the uh, English bands coming up in the mid to late 60s. And he was feeding them a lot of Fairport Convention, feeding them a lot of stuff coming out of the West Coast of the United States. You know, more and more progressive music that was coming out of there. But they, Fairport Convention, started to shy away from that by their second, third album. And yet Matthews was still really inspired by that. Ian Matthews was still really inspired by, you know, not only that, but some of the more country rock sounds that were starting to come out of the West Coast around the time of the late 60s as well. And he just wasn't interested in pursuing this, the more traditional folk English folk sounds and just wasn't a, wasn't fitting anymore. So Steve Barlby, AKA Howard and Blakely did write one song for this record. They wrote this, the song sweet bread that we just heard. They wrote several of the songs, but they wrote one song. They contributed one song that was kind of a bridge from that old sound that Matthews had been associated with to this new sound. And that would be the second song I'd like to feature which is The Castle Far, which is on side one, track three, if we'd like to hear that one now. I don't really want to, but I'll put it on for you. Oh, are you saying you... Yeah, we're going to talk more about that. <laughs> are you saying you don't like this song, Jeremy? Correct. It's probably my least favorite on the album as well, but that's okay. <laughs> this song is the reason I bought this album. <laughs> but I knew I was going to get this, so we'll talk more about that when we come back. Anytime music sounds like it's supposed to be being performed at a renaissance fair, I'm just not down with it. Sorry. I've, I've tried so many times. I just can't figure out how to appreciate that kind of music. I knew that I would get this from, I knew Sean in particular, and I had a, I suspected Jeremy would also not be into this. And Truth. <laughs> and I first became aware of this particular record 
when I was transcribing an interview, which our former guest Steve Krakow had done with Ian Matthews. If either of you are aware that I have been doing that for him. Oh, yeah. I remember. Well, for our listeners, I help with transcriptions of interviews that Steve Krakow, former guest on the show, does with musicians for a publication called the Galactic, the Galactic Zoo Dossier. And the interview with Ian Matthews will be available in the next issue whenever that comes out. And Krakow pointed to this song as a particular favorite on the record. And so I checked it out and just was immediately in all on board with it and wanted the, the whole album to find out that the rest of it <laughs> doesn't really sound <laughs> anything, anything like this as, as Sean would, would classify it. Ren fair folk. Now I, I'd also like to say that I don't necessarily think it's bad. It's just fully not my thing. No, no shade on anyone that's into that kind of stuff. I think it's bad. There's, especially in the chorus, that stupid flute keeps going for no reason. It's like meandering and not carrying any melody. It's like they nobody wanted to tell the guy to fucking stop. <laughs> well, you, well, you need to learn what you're talking about before you uh, say anything, Jeremy. That yeah, ooh, get him, Dolly, Peter. Get him. <laughs> that, that is Dolly Collins on the flute organ. Sister of Shirley Collins, the renowned folk artist. Doesn't mean it's a good arrangement. <laughs> I think it's fantastic. But there's no re- we, you know, we could uh, argue all day about this. And Unless I you're will. bringing a turkey leg over, then I don't want to argue about Ren Fair stuff. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I will stay as far as away as I can from an actual Renaissance fair. But if if the music's happening, I will be right there. You do always say that. <laughs> <laughs> he says it nonstop. It's really all I talk about when we don't have the record on for this podcast. <laughs> yeah, fortunately for you two, that's the only song like this that uh, the only song that sounds like this on the record. But I wanted to supp- if our listeners aren't familiar with Fairport Convention. Yeah, you're going to hear more sounds like that if you tune into a Fairport Convention album. Jeremy was saying, this could have just been on a Fairport Convention album. True. And I don't think Ian Matthews was particularly into that. In the interview, you know, Krakow is talking about it being a particular favorite. And Ian Matthews just wants to talk more about country rock and stuff like that. (laughs) I'm with Ian on this one. (laughs) Well, let's talk a little bit more about Ian. He was born... On June 16th, 1946, can you guess what artist he shares a birthday with? Mm, Tupac. You are correct. Hell yeah. What? <laughs> he Wait, was actually those timelines don't match up. Well, so it wasn't the same year, Jeremy. It was uh Tupac was born 25 years after Ian Matthews. And actually, that's how old Tupac was when he died, 25. Whoa, it's a conspiracy. (laughs) He was actually born, Ian Matthews was born Ian McDonald. And he was born in Barton-upon-Humber, Lincolnshire, England. He changed his name to Matthews to avoid confusion with... The Ian McDonald of King Crimson. Uh, inexplicably, okay. I I haven't figured out why, and there could be the, the answer for this is probably out there. But in 1989, Ian M- Matthews added a second I to his name, so it's spelled I A I N nowadays. But he was I A N until then. I haven't. Yeah, I, 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 I saw that and I was initially like, wait, has it always been spelled like that? And I just kept reading it as like a normal Ian. But uh, um, yeah, I'm looking at the albums and most of them are, you know, the I-A-N spelling, but the later ones are with the new spelling. Yeah, so he's really strayed far from the original name he was given, but. What was he uh, running he to- from? Yeah, no. <laughs> you'd think you wouldn't want to be a prominent musician. Well, I guess he's pretty obscure, right? That's that's why we're covering him on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the whole reason of like changing his last name just to avoid confusion with a member of King Crimson seemed really strange to me. Like, 
maybe if it was someone really famous, I could see it. But I mean, was it really going to be that big of a problem for him? Yeah, it doesn't like King Crimson have, uh, I don't know, like, it, or there's other definitely musicians that share. There's like a Steve Miller who was a punk artist from Michigan, not to be confused with Steve Miller from the Steve Miller band, but <laughs> neither of them felt the need to change their name. Yeah, super weird. So he moved to London in 1965 at the age of 18, and he worked at a shoe shop while also forming a trio called The Pyramid, and they released one single in January of 67. It was on Derham Records, and the guy who ran the label was friends with Ashley Hutchings of Fairport Convention. So in the winter of 67, Fairport Convention were looking for a male vocalist to accompany Judy Dybul, the female vocalist at the time, pre-Sandy Denny, who's the more famous vocalist from Fairport Convention. And so Matthews uh, sang with Dybul, Judy Dybul, on that first album, and with her replacement, Sandy Denny, on the second album. He left during the recording of the third album, which was called Unhalf Bricking. That's actually the album I was talking about on the episode we did with Steve Krakow, and I mistakenly said Liege and Leaf. I, so I'm just correcting myself <laughs> from a, several episodes <laughs> later. <laughs> yeah, it was on half bricking that had all the Dylan covers on it. After recording just one song on that Percy song, a Dylan cover, he was he was asked to leave. He, and he wasn't really interested in doing that more traditional English material that they were strongly leaning on. So he he was into that exciting new stuff coming out of the West Coast of the USA and the country rock. And he really likes stuff uh, like Ian and Sylvia as well, the Canadian folk duo that I plan on covering at some point on here. Actually, the name Matthew Southern Comfort comes from an Ian and Sylvia song called Southern Comfort. It, oh. We probably all thought it. We probably all thought it came from the the beverage. That was my assumption. Same. <laughs> Yeah, he was into the Flying Burrito Brothers as well, which I think you can probably hear on some of the more country rock leaning stuff here. Oh, uh, definitely. Yeah. Strong comparison. This was supposed to be a solo album under his own name, under Ian Matthews. But at the last minute, he changed it to being under the band name Matthews Southern Comfort. I think he just didn't feel like he was established enough as an artist to be like, here, I'm. this is my solo career now. So I'd like to play another song. We'll go back into the stuff that you guys are going to appreciate more. Because there are no, there's nothing else for me on this album. It's done. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to hear Please Be My Friend, which is, this is the first one we're featuring that was written by Matthews on this album. And that's side one track for Jeremy. Please and thank you. Once I sung and I told everyone told me I'd never win And I struck my best friend The saying that you were just a play girl Taking me in Please be my friend Just forget what I've done And let's start again That song sounds like the record cover looks like. <laughs> it, like, exactly. 
Would you like to describe yeah. the record cover to us, Jeremy? Yes. You got a shaggy haired uh, Brit fella standing in a field, and there's a semi transparent overlay of his face looking a little sad. I'm pretty sure asking me if uh, I want to be his friend. <laughs> That's accurate. Yeah, it checks out. Makes sense to me. So we heard some steel guitar in there. That is a fellow named Gordon Huntley, and he was the only one. Well, I, I believe I, I could be wrong, but I believe he was the only one on this record to go on to actually play in the Matthews Southern Comfort Band when it was officially formed after this. On that one, so that I mentioned that was uh, Ian Matthews original. That's the first one that we've heard that was an original of his from this record. So I don't and I don't really know how much songwriting he had done in Fairport Convention. You know, he was brought in as kind of a support a support member, but you know, he was you know singing the leads along with uh, Judy Diable, trading off and harmonizing. I believe this is kind of probably more of his first ventures into really uh, you know writing on his own. Well, he kind of had a thing for doing cover songs, right? Because like two of his biggest hits are both covers. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, he, that theme continued throughout his whole career. Yeah, and we plan to come back and talk more about him because you you were aware of a different whole different section of his career, right, Sean? Yeah, I kind of got turned on to Ian Matthews on my own, maybe about six ish months ago, around the time we did the first episode of this podcast on Jimmy Spheris. And then I started listening to artists with a similar sound, you know, doing the old Pandora radio. And one of the ones that jumped out to me initially was Ian Matthews. So I've been kind of on the look for his records since then. And the only two I've purchased so far are his uh, 1972 album, Tigers Will Survive, on the Vertigo label, which is not entirely dissimilar to this record. And then the other one, which is as easiest to find, from 1978 the album stealing home which is basically a power pop record like you had actually heard some of the songs off that and weren't even aware that it was ian matthews it sounds so different is that the yeah. one with shake it baby yeah shake it all you can tonight yeah i remember we listened to some of that on our way back from recording the episodes in chicago and then i had you put on the castle far and you and you guys kicked me out of the car <laughs> yeah then you walked all the way home from chicago just got back <laughs> yeah it was like gary it was around gary that you kicked me out <laughs> and i'd do it again <laughs> <laughs> i walked from the castle far God. you know i i had a thought while listening to that last song that there's something kind of magical about artists from other countries becoming obsessed with american folk music and then putting their own spin on it you know, I immediately thought, of course, of Neil Young and the band, other kind of roots rock people that are kind of looking from the outside, but still in some ways having more of an appreciation for it than people who may have been to a, a closer proximity. Yeah, totally. The, uh, in fact, I was going to comment on that, is that. I'm glad that while he clearly is an influenced by that, he's not trying to put some kind of American twang on his voice. Yeah, it definitely it didn't sound like, oh, this is the genre I'm going to try out. It was obviously like, I'm making the music I want to the way I want to. I just happen to like these this variety of sounds that all kind of blend together. It's, it's a very natural, very natural blend, I think. It's always interesting when there are artists that I've heard interviewed who almost, maybe it's a bad word to use, but they almost fetishize American rock and American culture. Some of those Japanese musicians are that way too. The like the Japanese noise people, Narita from High Rise was clearly a huge fan of American rock and roll, and uh, you know the he shreds. You're familiar with High Rise, right, Sean? Oh yeah, yeah. And the the interview that uh, Krakow did with Narita, it's just yeah, he's all about. He's talking about uh, who is it? Uh, oh, Grand Funk, Mark Farner from Grand Funk Railroad. And Big Brother and the Holding Company. And it's, but you have to figure, yeah, it's probably has that element of just being sort of the, the alien and unfamiliar when it's from another part of the world. Sure. 
Going back to going back to what we talked about at the very top of the episode. Yeah, if you buy this on Discogs, you're probably going to pay around ten dollars. But I don't think most people know. Even people who are digging on Fairport Convention might not really know who that what this is or who this is if they see this record. And it's not super common, but there's a good chance that if you come across this in a record store, you're going to find it for five bucks. Oh, definitely. I don't know if you stumbled on this, Peter, but the Matthew Southern Comfort Masters were amongst the ones lost in the 2008 Universal Fire where all the masters burned up for a bunch of artists. So that that could also play into the price being up because it's never going to get reissued. That's entirely possible. Yeah. If our listeners aren't familiar with this incident, do either of you want to take on explaining just a little bit about that? I It was a ton of stuff that was major stuff that was lost in that. I mean, that's basically my description of it. There was a fire that was major and a ton of stuff got lost. <laughs> a lot of master yeah. tapes from some very prominent artists. So the kind of thing where if they're going to do a reissue of a lot of this material, they're going to have to source a really nice copy of something that's already been pressed because they can't just go back to those master tapes anymore. So in effect, some stuff can never fully be reissued again. Yeah. And I think like Nirvana's Nevermind would be amongst that stuff that was lost, like really major releases. Yeah. It's intense. Uh, It it took like a decade for that story to really gain wide exposure though. Yeah. I remember hearing about it like a year or two ago, but yeah, it happened in 2008. You said, yeah, yeah the, I think so. The New York Times broke the story. Otherwise, they just kind of kept it under wraps and played it down like it was like not a big deal. Huh. Wow, that's weird. And Ian Matthews was lost in that. Matthews Southern Comfort. Uh, I also thought it was interesting reading that later on in his career, he became an A&R rep for Island Records and then Wyndham Hill Records. That, that's like a direction I wouldn't really have expected, but kind of makes sense, I guess. Yeah, yeah sometimes it's almost, I guess, I hate to make a sports analogy. If Krakow's listening, uh, I'm, I apologize, but... <laughs> 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 Yeah, just that like a lot of former like baseball players will end up going on to be scouts for teams and whatnot. And I have to I feel like that happens in in music sometimes too. they people who were involved on, you know, kind of at the forefront in the public eye end up working more behind the scenes. I think like that band, the West Coast pop art experimental band. Michael Lloyd from that band was working as an a and r person even like as early as the nineteen early nineteen seventies huh yeah, I'm really curious what artists he got signed to Wyndham Hill Records. be really interested to know where well he you had know what Sean that. you have timed it before you do an Ian Matthews episode. you can figure that out <laughs> all right <laughs> that's my mission I have Peter, I have bad news. what's that? I was looking through the the list in the Universal Fire. Tupac Shakur is in this list. No. It's like pretty much every one anyone's ever heard of is in this list. It's kind of insane. It's the first wow. time I'm looking at it. Yeah, it's it's almost like you don't want to look at it because it's there's some pretty major works that were lost. I just hope Me Against the World wasn't lost. Valid. <laughs> well, that's really all I have. Y'all got anything else you want to say? Before we uh, we go, I, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about the one we're going to go out on because it has a little interesting story to it. But So where did you first hear about Ian Matthews and what, what other records do you have of his? I'm curious. I was familiar with Ian Matthews' name from the association with Fairport Convention. But when Krakow asked me to do the the transcription of the interview... I really wasn't that familiar with everything he had done. You know, he, he, and you'll talk when we do your episode, you'll talk more. Uh, He did have a band with Andy Roberts, who was also the other person that was in that interview, uh, participated in the interview that I transcribed for Krakow. They had a group together called Plain Song. Andy Roberts was from a group called the Liverpool Scene, and he's played on tons of stuff as well. But I really wasn't that familiar with Ian Matthews prior to doing the transcription. And so... I really learned of this record from uh, Krakow talking to Ian Matthews in that interview. And 
once I started checking out, well, once I checked out the Castle Far, I ordered I ordered a copy, and I think I got it for like five bucks off Discogs at the time, and then was just really blown away by the whole record as being you know a huge Graham Parsons fan and Michael Nesmith fan. It falls right into that. A lot of people think that uh, Ian Matthews is kind of an unsung country rock pioneer, and he's not American, which is usually. <laughs> where that stuff that gets celebrated gets talked about is American. Sure. But really, Sean, I when I wasn't even aware that the song that I knew of his was his recording when you played that for us. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't really have other records by Ian Matthews. Yeah, and there's a ton of stuff to explore. I mean, you mentioned all those side projects. I was unfamiliar with those up until a couple days ago starting to do some research on this episode. And some of those sound really interesting. Like he had a fully power pop side project called hi-fi where he does a prince cover on it that i'm really curious to listen to now and he has a vast discography and he's still putting out records he like just dropped a new matthew southern comfort record like two weeks ago i think honestly (laughs) yeah he puts them out about as often as we put out episodes of the podcast all right so i'm gonna throw you a hard question and we can just cut this if uh, you don't have an answer but do you have any extra credit recommendations of similar albums to this vibe that could be found on the cheap. Oh God, there's, I might have to look up the guy's name, but there's another artist I found. Well, of course uh, there is Ian and Sylvia who is not Ian Matthews. It's Ian and Sylvia or Canadian folk rock duo. And I'm probably going to feature an album of theirs eventually, but all of their stuff goes for two or three bucks in any store that you go to. They had a group called Great Speckled Bird that I don't think you're going to get for for cheap, but even their their stuff under the name Ian and Sylvia is good. Now, there's this guy, Jesse Winchester, who I believe Matthews might have brought up in that interview. Jesse Winchester, I don't know what his records go for, but he is definitely worth checking out. Really, really overlooked artist. Those probably aren't very cheap, though, I would imagine. I'm looking it up right now. Self-titled by Jesse Winchester, median value of nine ninety seven. But it looks well, like that's not could, too you, bad. That's... you could pick up a VG copy on Discogs for five bucks. Actually, there's a there's a VG plus VG plus copy right now, five dollars straight up. That works. Check out Jesse Winchester. You won't regret it. There you go. The other two artists that I got turned on to at the same time as Ian Matthews are jonathan edwards who i will definitely be doing an episode on soon as well and another guy named jd souther that are uh yeah. both really good mix of folk and country and other kind of rootsy styles that i would highly recommend that are also pretty cheap yeah yeah jd souther is a name that i know as well i couldn't name anything offhand but uh and jonathan edwards of course uh was it sunshine go away yep that's his one big hit any Jonathan Edwards record is great. The self-titled one is really easy to find. And then the J.D. Souther I have is his 1976 album, Black Rose. It's really good. I might know his name from you recommending him to me, and I might have checked him out. Yeah, I think I sent you guys a message around that time. Jeremy, you got any recommendations of this vein for the people? I feel like you're probably trying to to hide it, but uh, the smoothness you can definitely hear in Kenny Rankin. Ooh, that's true. <laughs> I know you're trying to That's another boy. Keep that name hidden from the masses so that you can swoop <laughs> yeah. in and get all the copies now. Gotta have all those cheap Kenny records for myself. Wasn't Kenny Rankin who we were lis- another one we were listening to on the way back from uh Chicago? Yeah, yeah. One of the few times where I've suggested an artist to Jeremy and he's instantly fallen in love. It's true. Well, I think you guys uh, enjoyed the the non Ren Fair folk songs off this. Yes. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I, this, this album was great. I'll get a copy the next time I see one. And, you know, maybe after listening a few more times, this Ren Fair shit might start getting to me. Who knows? Who knows what the future holds? <laughs> yeah. You should, uh, I'm curious how common it is. You know, it's, once again, this is, uh, it's hard to hit all three of our points of inexpensive, common, and underappreciated. But we're loose, casual podcast listeners. Please don't be too critical of us. We'll do that to each other. Sure. Yeah. I mean, if, you know, if you're one of the many people out there who's trying to collect every single record we talk about on this podcast, we're going to label this one as kind of an intermediate uh, digging level. You're not going to find it everywhere, 
But when you find it, it shouldn't cost you too much. And and like we said, pretty much anything in the folk and country genres are automatically a lot easier to find under price because so many record stores just have them in a pile in the back in a crate underneath the bins because they don't think anybody wants that crap. And most of the time they're right, which allows the more adventurous digger to sometimes get some really good deals. <laughs> well said. Well, so the song that I'm going to go out on is I've lost you, which there's a little interesting story. This was one, another one written by Howard and Blakely, AKA Steve Barlby. I don't think, I think Steve Barlby only exists on this album. I don't think that that's a name that that songwriting duo used. Otherwise it's interesting that they selectively used it for Ian Matthews, Matthews Southern comfort. So this song was on this album. It was the first time artist. He was the first artist to record it. But a few months later, in July of 1970, Elvis did a version of it, as in Elvis Presley. And that actually ended up being a hit song. So a song that was written for an Ian Matthews record ended up being a hit for Elvis shortly thereafter. Wow. And so that's side two. Track five, I've lost you, and that's what we'll go out on. So this has been yet another edition of I Buy That for a Dollar. My name is Peter Cook. My name is Jeremy Ruggles. I'm Sean Hartman. Far out, Sean Dad. <laughs> thank you. 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 I watch you sleeping and in your face. The sweetness of a child. Thank you for listening to another quality episode of I'd Buy That for a Dollar, the podcast. If you really enjoyed that and you would like to support us so we can keep doing this podcast for many months, many years to come, you can find us on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash I'd Buy That Podcast. We have some exclusive episodes up there. We just posted a new one. That's only for our $5 and up Patreon subscribers. And then we've also got uh, the ability to get these episodes several days before the rest of the public, if you'd like to. Or you can sign up for our monthly vinyl subscription plan, where we will send you a couple real records every month, included with a handwritten note of why we think those records are good. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week. I've lost you, oh, I've lost you. I don't reach you.